This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is the beginning of a new year and a new series. I'm looking forward to the next few months as I've come up with ideas for some really unique new topics for the podcast, and I can't wait to share those stories with you. But first up, we'll focus on crimes committed by what used to be called the fairer sex. But the women you will learn about in these episodes are some of the most cold-blooded killers I've come across. In the next three episodes, we'll take a look at women who can be considered serial killers, but their victims are not strangers. Instead, they are the very men they have vowed to love and cherish, their own husbands. First up, an American woman who married young and often. In total, she wed five times and killed twice. A third victim narrowly escaped with his life. Was this the case of a battered woman or a cold, calculating murderer? This is Chapter 1 of the series Black Widows, The Case of Betty Lou Beats. Hey, it's January. How are those New Year's resolutions going? A couple of years ago, I decided to make a resolution to get up very early every morning and complete my workout before doing anything else. Needless to say, that resolution didn't last long. If you couldn't tell by this podcast, I'm kind of a creature of the night, so it didn't quite work. Ah well, the best laid plans and all. Most New Year's resolutions don't stick. Did you know that 80% of them fail by the end of the month? So if you've been wanting to focus on your health, working out, eating better, it takes time and commitment, and it's not always easy or fun. But Daily Harvest has you covered in the eating better department. You can be eating fruits and vegetables every day without even trying, thanks to Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers carefully sourced, chef-crafted food built on fruits and vegetables. You can choose from more than 50 ready-to-blend smoothies, savory harvest bowls, soup, and breakfast bowls. Each single-serving cup comes ready to blend or heat. Just add water or milk to a smoothie or heat up a harvest bowl. So even a non-morning person like me can have a delicious, healthy breakfast in minutes. I love their cinnamon protein and banana oat bowl. It's a great way to start my day and feel good about my food choices. The best part? It stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to eat it. It's one step and five minutes max to prepare. So easy. Daily Harvest is the fast, easy, delicious way to load up on fruits and vegetables and to make a healthy eating habit stick. Go to daily-harvest.com and enter promo code ONCE to get three free cups in your first box. That's promo code ONCE for three free Daily Harvest cups at daily-harvest.com. That's daily-harvest.com. Gun Barrel City, Texas is located in Henderson County, southeast of Dallas. It sits on Cedar Creek Reservoir, an 18-mile or approximately 29-kilometer long waterway that provides boating, fishing, and beaches for residents and tourists alike. On August 6, 1983, the owner of the Redwood Beach Marina, located on Cedar Creek Reservoir, was informed by several of her customers that they noticed an empty boat drifting on the lake near the marina. Two men who kept their boats docked at the marina went out to investigate. One of the men untied his boat and rowed out about 50 feet into the marina, where a green and white boat was drifting. The two men climbed aboard the 19-foot outboard glastron and noticed that the motor had been pulled out of the water. It looked as if the boat may have encountered some engine problems. Inside the boat, they found a card that appeared to have been dropped, as well as a prescription bottle. The card was a fishing license made out to a Jimmy Don Beats, and the prescription was for nitroglycerin pills, commonly prescribed to people who suffer from chest pains and who may have previously experienced a heart attack. They found a pair of eyeglasses lying on the floorboards as well. There was no one located on the boat. The Coast Guard was called out to investigate. Meanwhile, Liz Smith, the marina owner, checked the phone book and found a listing for J.D. Beats. She attempted to call the number several times, but the phone on the other end went unanswered. Finally, at about 10 p.m., 
a woman picked up the line. She identified herself as Mrs. Beats. Smith told her about the discovery of the empty boat. Mrs. Beats said her husband, Jimmy Don, had gone fishing the night before, and she hadn't heard from him since, and had been worried sick. When Smith told her she'd been trying to reach her all evening, Mrs. Beats said she'd gone into Dallas to do some shopping. She'd returned about 8 p.m., but hadn't heard the phone ring since she'd been out in the yard planting flowers. She asked if she should come and get the boat, but Smith told her it was tied up now and it would probably be better if she waited by her phone in case her husband called. But about 10 minutes later, Mrs. Beats arrived anyway. She was out of breath from racing over to the marina office. The first thing Smith noticed about Betty Lou Beats was that she was perfectly groomed, with spotless clothes, a full face of makeup, and not a blonde hair out of place. She was an attractive woman who obviously took care with her appearance. Smith wondered how someone who'd just come from gardening could look so fresh and clean. Betty Lou began wondering out loud what could have happened to her husband. She explained that he'd been having trouble with his boat motor, but said he was very good at fixing things and had always done his own boat repairs. While she inspected the prescription bottle, she also said to no one in particular that Jimmy Don had had a heart attack five years earlier. In watching Betty Lou, Smith marveled at how strong and calm she appeared to be at this alarming news. She didn't cry and fall apart, as Smith herself had done a few years earlier, when her own husband died in a drowning accident. No, Betty was very composed, even when the sheriff arrived and said that the search for the missing man couldn't continue until the morning. It was already dark, and a storm was kicking up over the lake. It would be too dangerous and futile to try and conduct a search until dawn. Hearing this, Betty returned home. The sheriff's department set out to gather details about the missing man, Jimmy Don Beats. Beats was 46 years old and had been a firefighter for the Dallas Fire Department for 26 years. A native of Texas, Beats had been thrice married. His first marriage had produced a son, James Donald, who was called Jamie. He and Jamie's mother had divorced when their son was nine. His second marriage to Susie Robertson lasted 14 years, but hit a snag when Jamie, who'd come home to live with his father and stepmother full-time as a teen, began rebelling against the house rules, committing petty crimes, and generally being a pain in the, well, you know. Susie and Jimmy Don argued over Jamie's behavior and finally split up. Jimmy Don Beats was clearly the marrying type, and soon after he split with Susie, he met and married another woman. This third marriage would last only three months. Beats had begun talking to Susie again and trying to patch things up between them. He still loved her, and they began to discuss reconciling. But then, Beats met Betty Lou one night at the Cedar Club, a bar where many of the locals congregated. Betty Lou was working at the Cedar Club as a bartender and waitress. The regular patrons got a kick out of the feisty blonde, who didn't take any crap from the men who came in to drink, flirt, and hopefully tip big. At age 45, Betty Lou still had a trim figure and a youthful energy. She liked being on the receiving end of men's attention and had never had trouble attracting them to her. Now, she used her feminine wiles to make sure she left each shift with a pocket full of tips. There were always a few regulars who believed that they had a shot with the attractive barmaid and continued to try and gain her favor. But Betty Lou had what you could say was a type. She liked men who were a little rough around the edges, could match her shot for shot at the bar, and had a few bucks in their pocket and weren't afraid to spend it on her. She wasn't a gold digger, but she did like to be spoiled a bit by her man. She also liked a hands-on kind of guy who could work with his hands and knew his way around a toolbox or a motor. When Jimmy Don Beats walked into the Cedar Club in early 1982, Betty Lou would later say he was just the kind of guy she was looking for. Beats was tall, muscular, handsome, and at the age of 45, was just four years away from retirement with a full pension from the city of Dallas. He owned a three-bedroom home that was paid for in full. He also owned a boat that was docked just a few blocks from his residence in Glen Oaks. He struck up a conversation with Betty Lou at the bar, and sensing that she might be interested in him, he returned a few days later to ask her out for the following weekend. 
She said yes, and on their first date, he took her out on the lake on his 19-foot boat. They shared a romantic picnic lunch provided by Betty. Beats was instantly smitten with Betty, impressed at how happy and bubbly she was. He saw how hard she worked at the bar, and she never complained. He loved how positive she was, and she was fun. They laughed and joked all day long, and he didn't hate how affectionate she was either. She constantly had a hand on his arm or leg, and before long they were hugging and then kissing passionately. He quickly fell in love. Within a month, he was spending more time with Betty at her trailer home near Cedar Creek Lake than at his own home in Glen Oaks. Beats only had a few short years until his retirement, and he wanted to spend the rest of his life with a woman he loved, and he loved Betty. Just a handful of months after meeting her, Beats asked Betty to marry him, and she agreed. They were married on August 19, 1982. But just a few days shy of their first wedding anniversary, Jimmy Don Beats went missing and wouldn't be seen alive again. After Jimmy Don Beats' boat was found abandoned, authorities conducted an all-out search for the missing firefighter. The following morning, a search headquarters was set up near the lake. If Beats had suffered a heart attack or other injury and had fallen into the water, they would need to search acres of the lake separating where the boat was launched and the marina. The Coast Guard had several boats searching various parts of the water. Volunteers had also arrived to help out, including 55 firefighters from the Dallas Fire Department. Days turned into weeks, and after 13 days, they had to concede that beats could not be found, and the search was called off. But there were those who had their suspicions right away. One was Jimmy Don's father, who had never liked Betty Lou, and who immediately suspected her of having something to do with his son's disappearance. Jimmy Don's son, Jamie, also had his suspicions. He pegged Betty as manipulative and self-centered and had told his dad as much when he'd started getting serious with her. But he couldn't talk Jimmy Don out of marrying her. Soon after they'd wed, Betty had voiced her objection to her new husband providing financially for his 25-year-old son. Jimmy Don and Betty were living on her property while Jamie stayed at the lake house. Now Beats told his son that to remain living in the house, he'd have to start paying him rent and utilities. This was not an unreasonable request, but Jamie knew it was at Betty's urging, and he resented her for it. Jamie had noticed some things out of the ordinary on his dad's boat the day he went missing. His CB radio wasn't in the boat. His dad was a creature of habit. He was always careful and took the CB radio with him without fail when he went out on his boat. In addition, he always placed the radio on the same shelf. Jamie noticed its absence. He found the presence of the nitroglycerin tablet strange, too. Yes, his father had had a heart attack five years earlier, but he hadn't taken the medication in over two years, and this was an old prescription. He immediately suspected that Betty might have had his father taken care of to collect his life insurance. He felt his suspicions were confirmed when he heard that Betty had gone to the fire department to collect his father's paycheck while everyone else was preoccupied searching for him. He expressed his concerns to the authorities at the time, but they were ignored due to the fact that almost everyone knew about his animosity towards Betty. The rest just thought his grief and panic were making him imagine things. But still convinced that his stepmother might be somehow involved in his father's disappearance, Jamie contacted a lawyer about tying up his father's assets so she couldn't get her hands on them until they had some answers. But other people besides Jimmy Don's family members found that something was not quite right about Betty. The search volunteers, especially the firefighters who'd known Jimmy Don for years, became irritated with her when she arrived each day of the search looking fresh as a daisy. They themselves had spent sleepless nights and hot, humid days in search of their brother, while his wife appeared calm, cool, and seemingly without a care in the world. Thank y'all so much, she purred at them each day, with what they described as a Cheshire Cat smile. The fire department chaplain, Denny Burris, visited Betty right away at home to check in on her 
and offer her any emotional support he could while the search was ongoing. He came away feeling uneasy when her first question to him was what kind of benefits she'd be eligible for if her husband wasn't found. He answered that, to his knowledge, she'd be eligible to receive life insurance and his pension. She wanted to know how much money it would amount to, and he told her he wasn't sure, but he could check into it. He realized as he left that he hadn't seen her cry at all. A few days later, Burris returned to tell Betty that Jimmy Don held about $110,000 in insurance. He said that a double indemnity clause might apply if Jimmy Don's death was ruled accidental. Additionally, the pension plan would pay out approximately $900 per month in survivor benefits. Betty would be eligible to receive this payment for the duration of her lifetime. But when he told her how long it might take to receive the benefits, Betty stopped smiling. If no body was found, he explained, no payment could be made for seven years. Seven years, Betty wailed. What do they expect me to do in the meantime? While Betty Lou Beetz's behavior was raising some eyebrows after the disappearance of her husband, people would have been truly concerned had they known her history. Betty Lou Denevent was born on March 12, 1937, in Roxborough, North Carolina. She was the daughter of sharecroppers and grew up in relative poverty in a shack with no running water or electricity. When she was five years old, she moved with her parents and older brother Dewey to the state of Virginia, where her parents were employed at a cotton mill. There they lived in a more comfortable modern house and were able to provide more easily for their growing family. When Betty was eight, the Dunavants added another son named Jimmy to the family, and two years later, a second daughter named Jackie. Soon after their move to Virginia, Betty came down with the measles. She experienced fevers as high as 105 degrees or 40 degrees Celsius that wouldn't abate, and she suffered from painful ear infections. These infections left her with some hearing loss, and that, combined with the many days of school she'd missed, put her behind her classmates. Unable to hear the teacher clearly, but afraid to be ridiculed for being dumb should she ask for instructions to be repeated, Betty fell further and further behind in school. Suddenly, when Betty was 13, her mother Louise was hospitalized after she suffered what doctors would label a psychotic break. When Louise returned home, she continued to suffer from hallucinations. She heard voices in her head and would become hysterical, believing demons were appearing before her. She was hospitalized a second time, and this time she stayed for several months. To drown his worry and sadness about his wife's condition, her father James began drinking heavily. When drunk, he would become angry and would hit his kids with a belt for any number of reasons. Betty came to fear her father and dread displeasing him, lest she end up being on the receiving end of his belt. As the oldest daughter in the family, Betty was tasked with caring for her father and three siblings. She hated the chores, the cooking, and the general drudgery of this role, and soon found an escape when she met 18-year-old Robert Branson. When her mother returned home, Betty spent more time with the good-looking, dark-haired Branson, skipping school and coming home late. Her mother, fearing that Betty would end up pregnant out of wedlock, encouraged her to marry Branson, even though Betty insisted she was still a virgin. But Betty seized the opportunity, seeing it as a way out of her life with her unpredictable mother and drunk, abusive father. Branson and Betty were married in 1952, the summer after Betty completed the ninth grade. She was just 15 years old. A year later, Betty gave birth to their first child, a girl they named Faye. But rather than being happy, Betty found herself even more miserable than she'd been at home with her parents. She was stuck caring for a baby 24-7, as well as the cooking and cleaning she'd always hated. She also complained to Robert that there was no money for anything she wanted. He found a better job at a shipyard in order to please his young wife, but she saw her classmates attending dances and football games and felt she'd made a big mistake marrying so young. She left her husband and returned home with the baby, but became depressed. She attempted suicide by swallowing two bottles of aspirin. When Robert found out, 
he rushed to her bedside and vowed to do whatever he could to make her happy. The couple reconciled. To fulfill his promise, Robert Branson accepted a construction job in Texas. Before they moved, Betty gave birth to their second child, Connie. The family moved to Mesquite, a small town near Dallas. Robert provided well for his family, which continued to grow. In 1959, Shirley was born, followed by Phyllis. In 1964, their first son, Robert Jr., called Robbie, was added to the family. And finally, in 1966, their sixth and final child, Bobby, was born. After 14 years of marriage and six children, Betty was still trim and attractive. She liked to wear clothes to accentuate her curvaceous figure, and her hair was dyed a platinum blonde. Now that her older daughters were in their teens, she used them as babysitters while she headed out to have fun and reclaim her youth. She frequented East Texas honky-tonks, where she could drink all the free rounds of beer men would buy her and dance her days away. Of course, this began to cause problems in her marriage. Where before, Betty had been dedicated to keeping a nice home and caring for her children while Robert worked and provided financially, now the house was unkempt and the children neglected. Betty argued loudly that she was entitled to some fun and spent more and more time away from home. Finally, in 1969, Branson left Betty and demanded a divorce. Her 17-year marriage was over. Quickly, Betty realized her mistake. She was given full custody of the children and awarded $350 a month in child support. She wanted her husband back, crying and telling her children that she missed him and loved him, but he'd moved on. Wanting nothing more than a home and family and the love of a wife, Branson quickly married a younger woman soon after the divorce from Betty was finalized. Her children would say that Betty was never happy after the divorce and all the good things they remembered about their mother and their childhood evaporated. Times became difficult, with Betty being MIA at home, and the children often left to their own devices. She would say that Branson began skipping child support payments, so she needed to go out and find another man to provide for them. The family fell apart. Faye, like her mother before her, married at 15 and moved out. Ten-year-old Phyllis and eight-year-old Robbie were sent by Betty to live with their father and stepmother. Robbie was devastated to leave his mother, somehow sensing he was losing her. He was correct. Betty didn't see Robbie except once, for almost a decade. Connie soon moved in with her older sister, Faye, who'd been a surrogate mother to her most of her life anyway. Shirley bounced around, sometimes living with her mother and sometimes with friends. Bobby, the youngest, and only three years old when his parents split, was the only child who remained living with Betty long-term. Betty would quickly find herself married to a succession of men. She married a house painter named Billy York Lane in 1970, after dating for only a few months. Lane, she soon discovered, had a quick temper and a jealous streak a mile wide. Her children began noticing bruises on her, as it was hard not to see the clear marks on her face from slaps and even punches by her new husband. They believed he purposefully hit her in the face to make her less attractive to other men. After only a few months of marriage, Betty filed for a restraining order and then for a divorce. But she continued to see Lane, and the relationship remained volatile. In May of 1971, Betty was treated for a broken nose as a result of a beating by Lane. Her children would report that in the time leading up to meeting Lane, Betty's personality began to change. Where she was once a loving, caring, and fun-loving mother, she became a foul-mouthed, angry, and aggressive person. She'd become addicted to a diet drug called Dexatrim, which during that time contained the amphetamine-like compound ephedra. Whether as a result of the drug, her alcohol consumption, the aftermath of her divorce, or a combination of these things, Betty, according to her children, became a different person. On January 17, 1972, the Dallas County Sheriff's Department received a 911 call and arrived at Betty Lou Branson Lane's apartment just before 2 a.m. Officers found a man outside of Betty's back door, bleeding. He'd been shot. In Betty's version of events, 
Lane had seen her dancing with another man at the bar and had threatened her. She had gone home to avoid him, and he had called and threatened her some more before heading over. She then grabbed her gun in anticipation of his arrival. He began yelling at the back door, and when she opened it, he started coming towards her in a threatening manner. She pointed the gun at him, but he kept coming. She fired, and he staggered back out. She continued to fire as he fell off the stoop and landed on the ground. The police questioned her regarding why she opened the door if she was afraid he was there to harm her. She said she was afraid he'd destroy the door. They also asked why the two bullet wounds were located in Lane's back if he was coming towards her. For this, she had no answer. She was charged with assault with intention to commit murder with malice. Lane was taken to Parkland Hospital and rushed into surgery. Two bullets were removed. One had damaged a nerve in his leg, leaving him unable to walk. Once he could talk to police, Lane told a different version. He was at his daughter's house when Betty called and said she wanted him to come over to talk. He asked if it could wait until the morning, but she'd insisted he come over immediately. When he arrived, all the lights were off. He knocked, but Betty told him to leave. Next thing he knew, she had opened the door and was pointing a gun at him. She fired it at him, and he fell. The last thing he remembered was Betty saying, If you move, I'll shoot you again. Of course, the truth probably lies somewhere between these two stories, but the details mattered very little in the long run. Betty remained by Lane's side, nursing him after his surgery and helping him to learn to walk again. Some speculated that this was because she was buttering him up to drop the charges. If this was so, it worked, because before the case went before the court, Lane asked that the charges be dropped. He also offered to sign an affidavit stating that he'd threatened Betty. Without a complainant, the court dropped the charge from attempted murder to misdemeanor aggravated assault. Betty pled guilty to the reduced charge and was fined $150, paid by Lane. She was even able to convince the judge to have her gun returned to her. Lane and Betty remarried a month later. A month after that, they split for good. In Little Rock, Betty, now 35, met 33-year-old Ronnie Threlkold, an auto parts salesman at the local bar. She told him she was a divorcee with a three-year-old, at first failing to mention her five other children she'd left back in Texas. She and Ronnie hit it off immediately, and soon he was living with her and Bobby. At first, they were happy enough, but before long, an old pattern reemerged in Betty's life. She and her husband frequented bars and drank together, and jealousy reared its ugly head. Their arguments became more heated and then violent. Threlkold manhandled her and may have struck her as well. Betty didn't take this lying down, though, and would retaliate by slashing his tires and once threatened him while brandishing a tire jack. She'd since told him about her kids back in Dallas, and while at first she complained that they were like a noose around her neck, always wanting something, she later said she missed them and wanted to move back to Texas. Thinking this might help the relationship and make Betty happy, Ronnie agreed. They relocated to Texas and then married in 1978. Neither found happiness in this arrangement. For his part, Ronnie began drinking more and staying at the bar to avoid going home. Betty's moods fluctuated wildly, with 12-year-old Bobby saying she would be nice and loving one minute and raging and hateful the next. Betty was now over 40 and was paranoid about losing her looks. She was taking more diet pills and became jealous of her own daughters, even accusing her husband of sleeping with her girls. He adamantly denied he had any interest in his stepdaughters. This was the last straw. Ronnie left, hightailing it back to Arkansas. Betty, it seems, was desperately trying to prove to herself, if no one else, that she was still attractive and desirable. In August of 1979, she walked into Charlie's Angels Bar in Dallas, where the drinks flowed while scantily clad women stripped on stage. Betty approached the manager and asked for a job. She was told she'd have to come back on amateur night to audition before a crowd. Betty was game. After lying about her age and claiming to be 10 years younger, 
Betty agreed to return on Thursday night. She brought along a bikini and was given a set of pasties by another dancer. She was introduced as Sexy Tiger. In the past, she'd used the name Tiger as her CB handle. For you youngins, just Google it. She stepped on stage, dancing to the music. She was supposed to remove her bikini top in one quick move to reveal the pasties covering her breasts, but had trouble with the garment. Instead, as she flung off her top, one of the pasties went with it, leaving her fully exposed on one side. Thinking fast and enjoying the hoots and hollers she was receiving, she bent over to pick it up and then asked if anyone in the audience would like to help her put it back on. The first man to make it to the stage drunkenly began trying to place the sequin pasty while holding on to her breast. The audience howled. Betty was a hit. However, exposing of the nipple and being fondled in public was a no-no, according to city ordinances. And before she knew it, a man flashed a badge. He was with Dallas's vice squad, and she was under arrest. Betty was charged with public lewdness, fined $250, and jailed for 30 days. Within weeks, Betty met a roofer named Doyle Wayne Barker at a truck stop gas station. He was just her type. Dark-haired, good-looking, and muscular. He was divorced with two sons. They hit it off right away and began spending all their time together. By October of 1979, Betty married for the third time. Almost immediately, the couple began to fight. According to Faye, Betty's oldest daughter, Barker was a heavy drinker and often got into bar fights. After seven weeks of marriage, the couple separated. They divorced after only three months. Then Betty was involved in a serious car accident. She suffered a fractured skull, and her hearing, already poor since her childhood illness, grew worse, forcing her to wear hearing aids. She grew her hair longer to hide them. She also began suffering from migraines. Barker, hearing of the accident, returned to Betty, apologizing for their problems and vowing to treat her better. She took him back, and they remarried the following year. Barker's roofing company was located near Cedar Creek Lake, an hour southeast of Dallas. Betty decided she wanted to live by the pretty lake and offered to purchase a half-acre lot there for $8,800 if Barker would pay the same amount to purchase a new trailer home to place on the property. He agreed, and they moved to the lakeside trailer on the edge of Gun Barrel City. By all accounts, Barker was a good guy. Betty's kids liked him and thought he treated their mother well. She seemed so happy with him at first, so they were surprised when she began to complain bitterly about him. First, she said that he spent too much time away from home when he wasn't working. He saw his two teenage sons regularly, but Betty didn't like it when Barker brought them around. There was noticeable tension whenever they came to visit, but when he'd meet his sons in another location, Betty would complain that he wasn't home enough. She then began telling her daughters that Barker was slapping her around. They told her she should divorce him if that was the case. She said she'd handle things her own way. One day when Barker was away, and her daughter Shirley was visiting, Betty began complaining again. She had already rejected the idea of divorcing her husband, so Shirley asked what she planned to do. I'm going to kill him, Betty simply said. Shirley laughed, thinking she was just being dramatic. Just divorce him, Shirley reiterated. Then Betty said she couldn't do that. The trailer was in Barker's name, and she couldn't afford to pay for the lot and purchase another trailer as well. Shirley told Betty she was talking crazy and warned her that even if she was serious, she'd be caught. Betty assured her that she had it all planned out. Pointing to a freshly turned pile of earth in the backyard, she told her daughter that she'd asked a road worker to use his backhoe to dig her a hole for a new barbecue pit. That hole, she said, was where she was planning to place her husband's body. Shirley went home, and later that day, Betty brought young Bobby over to Shirley's house to spend the night with his sister. The next day, Shirley returned to her mother's and looked around, hoping to see her stepfather. But Betty was alone. I did it, Betty told her. It's over. She then began to explain how she'd gotten rid of her third husband. While he was asleep in bed, she told Shirley, 
she'd taken a pillow and placed it around the gun to muffle the sound. She'd pointed the gun at Barker's head and fired. As he let out a groan, she fired again. Then he lay still. She fired a third time to be sure. She'd worked quickly after that, gathering two sheets of plastic and wrapping them around the bloody body. Once wrapped, she retrieved a blue sleeping bag and pushed and pulled the body into it, and then zipped it closed. She then shoved the wrapped body into the closet and set about to clean up the evidence. Horrified, but worried about her mother being caught, Shirley agreed to help her get Barker's body into the hole in the yard. They waited until it was dark. Betty made drinks, and Shirley drank several of them, trying to numb herself for the task ahead. At dark, they dragged the body from the closet to the pit's four-foot opening, placing the body as flatly into the hole as possible before covering it over with dirt. Betty bought cinder blocks the next day to cover the hole completely. She didn't want neighborhood dogs coming over, trying to dig up the body. The next morning, Betty called Barker's boss, Jerry Kukendall. Betty dropped off her husband at work every weekday and knew that Jerry would be expecting him. She told him that she and Wayne had gotten into a big fight the previous night, and he'd taken off to buy cigarettes. She hadn't seen him since. When Barker didn't show up for work the next two days, Jerry drove over to his house. He was relieved to see Barker's truck in the driveway, thinking he must have come home and had spent the next day or two reconciling with his wife. When Betty answered the door, Jerry said he was glad Wayne had come to his senses and returned. Betty looked confused. Well, he's back, right? His truck is here, Jerry said. Betty explained that he had left on foot. She seemed angry and said she hadn't heard from him, not a phone call or anything. Jerry told her if she did hear from Barker to make sure to ask him to call. Betty promised to do so and quickly closed the door. Jerry knew something was wrong with Betty's story. Why would Wayne leave on foot when his truck was right outside? And even if he was angry with his wife, he wouldn't fail to call his boss, a man he'd worked for for years, and who was as close as a brother. No, something had happened to Wayne, he was sure of it. The last he saw of Betty was the following Friday, when she showed up at his office to pick up Wayne's paycheck. Whenever anyone asked about Wayne Barker, Betty simply replied that he'd left her. It wasn't hard for people to believe. Everyone knew about their on-again, off-again marriage and their history of fights and arguments. Before long, Betty became a regular at the local watering hole, the Cedar Club, which, despite its fancy name, was just a dive bar located on Seven Points Highway 274, just a stone's throw from the marina. Betty began waiting tables at the bar to take home a few bucks, and also, it seems, to scope out a new husband. Before long, she met Jimmy Don Beats, who became husband number five. After Beats went missing, it was first believed to be due to a boating accident. The clues pointed to engine trouble on the boat, and perhaps while attempting to work on the stalled boat in the dark, he'd suffered a heart attack and fell over the side into the lake. But neither investigators nor those who knew Jimmy Don thought this scenario held water. Pardon the pun. First of all, Jimmy Don's CB radio was not on the boat, and everyone knew that this was something he brought with him without fail. Secondly, the nitroglycerin tablets found spilled on the boat's floorboards was an old prescription that his son said he hadn't even taken for over two years. Third, a thorough search had been conducted of the lake, and if Beats had fallen into the water, it was believed he would have been found within a few days. A large boat race took place one day after Beats went missing, and there were many boaters on the lake. Someone would have seen a body pop up out of the water, authorities believed. A body after death fills with gases that cause it to float to the surface when submerged in the water. With all the searchers and traffic on the lake, the body was unlikely to be missed. They concluded that most likely the body was not in the lake and that Beats's boat had been staged to look like he'd drowned investigators began to look at who might be responsible for his disappearance. When they talked to friends and family members, Betty's name was mentioned more than once. After discovering that she'd shot her second husband, Billy Lane, and that her fourth husband, Doyle Wayne Barker, had also gone missing, 
they began to seriously consider that Betty knew more about Jimmy Don's disappearance than she was letting on. They discovered that she was set to inherit a tidy sum if Jimmy Don Beats died. They also discovered that she'd already inquired about when she would receive the benefit payments. This could just be a concern of a woman left without a husband's income, but then they heard another story about Betty and life insurance from a family member. Jimmy Don had a niece named Jackie Collins, who worked for J.C. Penney Insurance in Plano, Texas. A few months before Jimmy Don went missing, Jackie happened to see a new life insurance policy come across her desk with her uncle's name on it. It was a $10,000 policy, and the first premium had already been paid on it. But something odd stood out to her. The address attached to the policy was not her uncle's residence. He lived in Glen Oaks, and the policy was tied to an address in Mesquite, Texas. She took the policy to Jimmy Don's fire station where he was on duty. He was surprised and said he had no knowledge about the insurance policy. She told him if he hadn't authorized it, all he had to do was write please cancel on it and sign, and she'd take care of it. He did so. In reading the policy, he saw that Betty was listed as the beneficiary, and he recognized the address as belonging to her daughter Faye. But the policy was canceled, and he thought no more about it. The story did give the investigators looking into Beats' disappearance pause, though. They began to look into Wayne Barker's disappearance as they worked on the Beats case, the common denominator, of course, being Betty Lou Beats. They heard gossip that Barker had deserted Betty, but they could not locate him and found that no one had heard from him since October of 1981. To them, it looked like a pattern was emerging. Out of her five husbands, two had gone missing and one had been shot by Betty. They thought they may be looking at a Black Widow case and believed if she had killed Beats, her motivation might be financial gain. Beats's son, Jamie, had started spending weekends at his father's home in Glen Oaks, trying to keep his stepmother from taking it over. However, it caused friction between him and his wife, so Jamie stopped staying at the house. He changed the locks to try and keep Betty out of the home, but he discovered that she had put the house on the market, listing it for $42,000. He hired a lawyer who filed a restraining order against Betty that forbade her from selling any property belonging to Jimmy Don while his status remained unknown. But that didn't stop Betty from falsely signing Jimmy Don's name to a power of attorney form a year after his disappearance. Using the forged document, she sold the boat for $3,200. Not wanting to wait seven years to receive her life insurance and pension payouts, Betty hired a lawyer to find out how she might speed up the process. She was advised to seek a determination of death, a legal document that would declare her husband dead so that she could collect the over $150,000 in insurance and pension benefits that were being held. In February 1985, Betty filed for a death certificate for Jimmy Don Beats. Three weeks later, the court officially declared him deceased. Betty was now able to collect widow's benefits, as well as inherit any property or other assets Beats owned. But investigators were hot on her trail, and would soon get a tip from an informant that would blow the case wide open. Sheriff's Deputy Rick Rose first heard the name Gerald Albright from an informant named Ron Becker. Becker was a petty criminal who'd mostly been arrested on drug charges and had given Rose information that helped him solve a couple of previous cases. In the spring of 1985, Becker said he had some information to share with the deputy in exchange for helping him skate on his latest drug possession charge. Rose told him to spill what he knew, and if they could confirm it with a polygraph test, he may just play ball. Becker said he could tell him what happened to Jimmy Don Beats. He hadn't drowned. He was murdered, he told him. Besides that, he could tell him where the body was. His wife Betty did it, he told Rose. She shot him and stuffed him in a wishing well in her yard. Becker then explained that Betty herself had spilled this information to a married guy she was sleeping with named Gerald Albright. Albright was a local real estate agent who liked to drink at the Cedar Club. Betty had been dating a guy named Ray Bone, 
and entered into another hard-drinking, mutually abusive relationship. One day, she decided to retaliate for their latest fight by responding to Albright's advances at the bar. She went with him to a motel, got good and drunk, and spent the day in bed with him. It was then that she spilled the beans about her missing husband. Here we are fucking and having so much fun. You wouldn't think it was so funny if you knew that one guy I fucked is buried in my front yard. After receiving this tip, Deputy Rose called the DA's chief investigator, Michael O'Brien. He arranged for a polygraph to be administered to the informant, who passed with flying colors. Next, they talked to Gerald Albright, who confirmed what the informant said about Betty admitting to killing her husband. He explained that Betty was pretty drunk when she said it, so he hadn't taken her seriously. Meanwhile, Betty's daughter Shirley had been living with the strain of being her mother's accomplice to murder after the fact. She'd spent sleepless nights wondering when they'd be caught, and it weighed heavily on her conscience. She ended up talking to her sister Phyllis and telling her about the murder her mother had committed. Now Phyllis also carried the stress of this knowledge. One night while drinking at a bar with a friend, Phyllis drunkenly confided that her mother was a husband killer. Shocked and horrified, the friend called the tip into Crime Stoppers. Deputy Rose tracked Phyllis down, and she quickly gave up what she knew. But Rose was surprised when Phyllis told him that she knew about Wayne Barker's murder by Betty. Rose now recalled the stories about Betty's former husband's disappearance and realized he was investigating two possible cases of homicide. Now with the information received from Albright and Phyllis corroborating the informant's tip, investigators asked the judge to issue an arrest warrant for Betty Lou Beats. They also requested a warrant to search Betty's property for the body of Jimmy Don Beats. On June 8, 1985, Betty was arrested and held on $100,000 bond. A search began that very evening. The first place investigators decided to search was underneath a wishing well located in Betty's front yard. Betty had told Gerald Albright that was where the body was hidden. The well was a decorative structure that stood in the middle of the yard. It was filled with dirt, and Betty had planted flowers in it. The neighbors recalled seeing her watering her flowers daily. Crime scene tape was strung up around the property, and a backhoe was brought to the site. It easily pulled down the wood frame and red brick base of the wishing well before hitting earth underneath. Several deputies were on hand with shovels, and they began to dig carefully into the dirt below. Only about one foot down, they encountered a piece of plywood. Once they removed it, they dug a few more inches to reveal a blue canvas. They soon realized it was a sleeping bag. They removed it and opened what was left of the rotted fabric to reveal a decomposed body. It would later be identified as the missing man, Jimmy Don Beats. The skull was discovered to have a bullet wound. But their work wasn't yet done. The backhoe was then employed to knock over a shed located in the rear of the property. Darkness had fallen, and they were working with spotlights to illuminate the dig site. As soon as the shed fell and the debris was cleared away, a sunken area was discovered underneath. They began to dig once more. Four feet down, an object was found that was determined to be another sleeping bag. It matched the same type and color as the one found under the well. Inside was the skeletal remains of Doyle Wayne Barker, missing for over four years now. After the two bodies were unearthed, Betty was charged with two counts of murder, and her bail was set for $1 million. Betty's daughter Shirley was also arrested and charged with murder. As investigators tried to put the pieces of the two murders together, Phyllis was brought in for further questioning. Deputy Rose had her explain once again how Shirley had told her she'd helped to bury Wayne Barker. They then asked Phyllis about Jimmy Don and whether Shirley had helped Betty that time as well. No, Phyllis said. She got my brother Robbie to help put Jimmy Don in the well. Rose was stunned. Betty had gotten two of her children to help in her murder plots? What kind of family was this? A deputy was sent to bring Betty's 21-year-old son, Robbie Branson, in for questioning. Once they told him why he was there, he quickly agreed to waive his rights and give them a written statement about his involvement. Robbie Branson had already begun to crack under the weight of the guilt he felt. 
He had already confessed to his girlfriend that his mother had killed his stepfather and that he'd helped bury him. Like most of the others who'd heard the story about the body under the wishing well, she hadn't believed him. Robbie told the deputy that one night in August of 1983, his mother told him that she was going to kill Jimmy Don. He asked her why. He thought Jimmy Don was a good guy and that his mother was happy with him. According to Robbie, Betty said that he had a lot of life insurance and she was tired of trying to make ends meet and worrying about the bills. Anyway, Betty had said, who knows when he'll start slapping me around like the others. Robbie couldn't understand what she was saying. As far as he knew, they'd never even had so much as a loud argument. And Jimmy Don always tried to make his mother happy. Just a couple of weeks earlier, Robbie had helped Jimmy Don build a wishing well that Betty wanted. They'd worked all day in the hot sun, but Jimmy Don hadn't complained. He just chuckled and told Robbie, what Betty wants, Betty gets. Robbie also told them that Jimmy Don had built the shed in the backyard. When Jimmy Don told Betty that the area she picked to have the shed built was sitting over a depression and not level enough, suggesting that they build it further back, Betty had become angry. So Jimmy Don built it where she wanted, right over the buried body of her former husband, Wayne Barker. The day Betty told Robbie she planned to kill Beats, she instructed him to leave and come back in a couple of hours. Jimmy Don was already in bed when Robbie left after 9 p.m. Robbie said that his stepfather went to bed early whenever he had an early shift at the fire station the next day. Betty told Robbie to find his younger brother Bobby and keep him out of the house as well. When he returned around midnight, Betty let him in and led him down the hall to the bedroom. There, Robbie saw the blue sleeping bag bulging at the seams and leaning against a wall. She told him to help her drag it to the wishing well. It was heavy and took some time, but they were finally able to get it across the yard and shove it over the side and down the four-foot-wide opening. The next day, Betty filled in the wishing well with dirt and planted flowers over it. A month after Shirley was arrested, she decided to make a full statement. She told investigators that Betty had told her she was going to kill Wayne Barker in October of 1981. Betty had later called her to say it was done and enlist her to help bury him. Then about a year later, Betty married Jimmy Don Beats. While Shirley knew her mother and Barker had a tumultuous relationship, she described Betty's marriage to Beats as a good one. All of Betty's children had loved Jimmy Don and saw that he treated her better than all of her other husbands before him. In July of 1983, Betty told Shirley that she was planning to kill Jimmy Don and revealed her plan to ask Robbie to take out Jimmy Don's boat and set it adrift so it would look like he'd drowned. Though really, Robbie had helped bury him in the wishing well. In exchange for her testimony, the murder charge against Shirley was dropped. On July 11, 1985, Betty Lou Beats was indicted on two counts of murder. Her trial for the murder of Jimmy Don Beats began on October 7th of that year. The Black Widow murder trial was big news in Texas and across the country. The highlight of the trial was when Betty was put on the stand to testify in her own defense. According to Betty, Jimmy Don was angry with Robbie for leaving the house a mess and wrecking their truck while they'd been away. The men had been arguing in the living room, according to Betty, and she went into the bedroom. Then she'd heard a shot. She said Robbie had killed her husband, and she had only helped him to get rid of the body in order to protect him. When asked about the life insurance money as a motive, Betty testified that she didn't know how much life insurance Beats had and hadn't known anything about a retirement fund before her husband disappeared. She said she loved Jimmy Don and that no one had ever been as good to her as he was. Under cross-examination, Betty said that she had no idea her other husband, Wayne Barker, was buried on her property, still insisting that she'd believed all along that he'd deserted her. When asked why she hadn't come forward during her first hearing to say that Robbie had killed Jimmy Don, she said she didn't know. During closing statements, the prosecutor pointed out that Betty said she'd only heard one shot, but there were two bullets found in Jimmy Don's body. The autopsy also concluded that Jimmy Don had been shot in the back of the head, unlikely if the two men had been fighting face-to-face, -face, as Betty had testified. 
The prosecutor pointed out that if her account was true, that still left the question of why she didn't try to get her husband medical attention instead of immediately focusing on hiding the body and cleaning up the crime scene. The jury didn't buy her story either. They found Betty guilty of the offense of capital murder. Her children, who still loved their mother, were heartbroken. Faye, her oldest child, still professed to believe her mother was innocent and that, quote, it had been an accident, end quote. Wayne Barker's sister said she felt relief at the trial's outcome because she finally knew how her brother died. Jamie, Jimmy Don's son, said, I think justice has been done. Now my father can rest in peace. Three days later, the court handed down her sentence. Betty Lou Beats was given the penalty of death by lethal injection. After receiving the death sentence, Betty Lou Beats was granted an automatic appeal. In the appeals court's original opinion, her conviction for capital murder was reversed because they found that murder committed for the purpose of obtaining insurance and pension benefits didn't constitute murder for remuneration as defined by the Texas Penal Code. I'll let you ponder that for a second. Yeah, I don't get it either. In 1988, the state requested a rehearing of her case, and the Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed her conviction and sentence. Her execution was scheduled for November 8, 1989. A stay of execution was filed on October 16, and a habeas petition was filed. In June 1990, the court denied habeas relief. The execution date was then set for December 6. On September 25, a second petition was filed with the Supreme Court. It was denied on November 26. On December 3rd, three days before the scheduled execution, Beats filed an application for a stay of execution with the federal court. The stay was granted on December 4th. In the meantime, Betty sat on death row and began giving interviews claiming that she had been horribly abused by all of her husbands. She wrote an account titled, From Darkness to Light, a battered woman's story from Texas Death Row, where she accounted a life of abuse beginning at the age of three. She wrote that she had been, quote, literally held hostage and threatened with guns placed to my head, unquote, in her own childhood home. She said she was virtually deaf and could not hear enough to understand what was happening during her trial. As a result, she was now awaiting execution. Her time was running out, she wrote, the state of Texas will pick up where my husband's left off. While the Texas law enforcement out there did nothing to help me, it is now legal for them to finish the job. Anti-death penalty advocates took up Betty's cause, and her upcoming execution was debated in the media. Thousands of letters were sent to then-Governor George W. Bush, asking him to spare Beat's life as her appeals were exhausted. They expressed concern that the abuse and extreme violence she had suffered had not been considered during her trial. Her execution date was finally set for February 24, 2000. On February 16, Bush declined to step in to halt the execution. On February 18, her lawyer filed suit against the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles, claiming that state law required that special clemency consideration be given to battered women convicted of killing family members. On February 22, the clemency request was denied. On February 23rd, a federal judge denied her motion for a stay of execution, calling the filing, quote, yet another example of a prisoner attempting to delay execution just prior to the execution date, unquote. An hour before the scheduled February 24th execution, the Supreme Court declined to intervene. Minutes later, Governor Bush declined to grant a stay of execution. Betty was transferred to the death house in Huntsville, Texas. While she waited to hear if the execution would be stayed, she read the Bible and visited with a chaplain. She did not meet with any family members. She declined a last meal. She was brought into the chamber, strapped to the gurney, and the IV that would deliver the lethal cocktail was inserted. The curtain was opened to allow a few people to witness the execution through a glass window, including Jimmy Don Beats' son Jamie and Rodney Barker, Wayne Barker's son. She made no eye contact with the victim's family members and declined to make a final statement. 
she was pronounced dead at 6.18 p.m. She was only the fourth woman to be put to death in the U.S. since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976, and only the second to be executed in Texas since the Civil War, following convicted murderer Carla Faye Tucker two years earlier. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I want to thank Erica Kelly, the host of Southern Fried True Crime Podcast. It was her wonderful voice you heard playing the part of Betty Lou Beats in today's episode. If you haven't yet found her podcast, I highly recommend it. If you like this podcast, I know you'll like hers. It's very similar to OUAC, but a Southern Fried version. I also recommend another true crime podcast for your listening pleasure, Nighttime Podcast. Here's a few words about that show from host Jordan Bonaparte. Canada, the great white north, a utopia of manners, health care, and big-hearted people saying A. Hey. Sadly, that place doesn't exist. I'm Jordan, and on my show Nighttime, I uncover a version of Canada that is far darker than the one used in advertising to sell coffee, beer, and cars. The Canada I discuss on Nighttime is a twisted maze of crime, missing persons cases, unexplained events, and stories that prove Canada is not what they want you to think. If you want to join me, subscribe to the Nighttime Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else. We reached over 10 million downloads last month, and I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for listening. I'm excited for everything that's coming up this year, and I'll be sharing details with you as they're confirmed. You can now listen to Once Upon a Crime on Pandora, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. These apps are a great way to share the podcast with others. I thank you in advance for telling a friend. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. My assistant is Lorena Garcia, and my copy editor is Crystal Dernan. Until next time, be good to one another. Thank you.